It's awesome to share with you guys this morning. It's awesome anytime I get to get up here and share. We've been doing a series called The Kingdom of God is Like or The Kingdom of Heaven. And we've been looking at these parables in Matthew 13, where Jesus seems to teach about what the kingdom of heaven is like. And he goes through these different stories. Uh, and I love each of these stories that we looked at. There's some in there we haven't looked at. So I want to encourage you to sit and read it. It's an amazing chunk of teaching. And I think you'll get a lot out of it. And you might even get stuff out of the stories we looked at that are a bit from a different angle. And I think that's the beauty of the Bible. It has a story to tell each one of us. But so far in our journey through the series, we've looked at how God's kingdom can't be stopped. And love wins like a mustard seed taking over a garden. So in the parable about the kingdom of heaven being like a mustard seed, we sometimes forget that mustard seeds are these incredible things. And in ancient culture, they knew two things. They had a medicinal use, and if you planted them with other things, they would overtake everything. So I think to me, this is a sign of how God's kingdom can't be stopped. Even if it looks like it sometimes. Even if it looks like, you know, the world's gone too far and there's no hope for it. That's not the case. And I love that parable. I think it's important for us to hold on to that. And then following that, we looked at how the kingdom of heaven is waiting to be cultivated and discovered like a hidden treasure or a valuable pearl. And again, I think this is a good one for us to hold on to. Both of those stories about the kingdom of heaven seem to have some action. You have an individual looking for a hidden treasure and then taking action and buying the land. You have a merchant who finds a fine pearl. So I think it's important for us to hold on to these parables, to realize that the kingdom of heaven is around us. Yes, there's something glorious waiting at the end of time, but there's part of that breaking through in our here and now. And we can cultivate that, we can discover it if we're willing to go looking. And then last week, we looked at kind of how salvation is this really big word, right? It's this umbrella word that so many things come under, sanctification, all this stuff. And we looked at how salvation is an event and a process. And kind of embracing this allows us to be humble and drop the weight of perfection. You know, too often, uh, I've met people on their journey at different points with Jesus, and they might mess up, and one of the comments they say pretty quickly is, you know, I'm a Christian, I shouldn't do this anymore. You know, and I don't know about anyone else, uh, but if I sin and mess up, I don't think the devil has to tell me about it, I do a good job beating myself up about it, and that kind of stops God's grace from coming in. So we look at, we don't have to be perfect. Salvation, yes, is the event of what Jesus did for us that saves us, but then there's a process of how that flows out. And we don't have to be perfect. We take that off. We can be a bit humble. So I've been loving this series, looking at these stories. And today, we're going to look at becoming a scribe for the kingdom of God, or the kingdom of heaven. Before we do, though, I have a question for you all. Are you ready for my question? Mm -hmm. All right. Have you ever heard the terms progressive Christianity and conservative Christianity? Yes. Not yet. Some people, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about these. Now, these are oversimplified definitions from that, all right? I'm not saying this is exactly what it is. This is me trying to simplify it. So, for me, conservative Christianity is a movement within Christians that fight to retain the orthodox and long-standing traditions and beliefs of Christendom. So that's what they fight for. <coughs> Which isn't a bad thing, so I'm not saying it's right or wrong, I'm just saying that's, if you're going to label it and hear that label, that's kind of what it means. Uh, on the other side of the coin, you have progressive Christianity. And this is a movement within Christianity that desires to question tradition and belief, desiring to put into actions the teachings of Jesus Christ. So this is a movement that's really focused on orthopraxy. It's a big word for you know, acting out your faith. You're putting your faith into action. I guess they're really moved by the, the heart of Jesus, some of Jesus' social justice movement, the way he extends boundaries, and they want to see that keep it being extended. 
So they're willing to wrestle with things, to look at traditions of old. They don't really hold too tightly to anything. And if I can put it even simpler, bear with me, this is another simplified math definition, so you know, feel free to disagree later. But to me, conservative Christianity kind of means exclusivity to retain Christ Christian traditions, beliefs, and doctrines. It's this element of we know this truth, this truth that the early church made, traditions, beliefs, doctrines, and we hold on to them. And the conservative Christianity view is to hold them at the point of excluding people, pushing people away, or anything that can disrupt those central beliefs and traditions that we hold tightly to. So that's what I kind of feel conservative Christianity does. Which I want to say isn't a bad thing again, so please hear me. I'm not saying any of these are right or wrong. And while progressive Christianity to me is, is inclusivity to extend God's radical grace and acceptance. And sometimes this can go too far. Sometimes you see the progressive Christianity movement doing things that I will say I believe is out of line. But you see both of them doing it, right? So I sit here and I go, which one of these within our Christian movement Within, uh, if you want to start labeling them too, there are brilliant theologians on both sides. There are people on both sides who've probably spent like 50 years learning Greek and Hebrew uh, and like studying scripture. So which one's the right movement? And what do we do with that? With these two different views, with these two different views that, let's be honest, they're getting louder and louder. I mean, have you guys seen what's going on with the Anglican Church at the moment? There's a big debate within their Christian movement about what to do with the whole homosexuality, and that caused heats because there's different thoughts on it. And there's this great infighting starting to happen in tension. So what do we do with these brilliant theologians on both sides? Where do we need to sit? And I think... Uh, we discover something on where we need to sit on this when we look at the story that we're going to look at today, which kind of wraps up this section of teaching from Jesus found in Matthew 13, verse 51 to 53. And this is kind of his last little thing that he does before he wraps up and he moves on to some another place and starts doing more teaching. And I think we discover kind of what to do. I think there's a hint at it. But before we look at it, though, I want to share something with you guys about the Gospel of Matthew. So bear with me. The author of the Gospel of Matthew was most likely not the disciple Matthew. That's most likely. No one knows without certainty. So there's a great big debate that goes on in theology, right? So early on, there was evidence that the early church and their early fathers there is, you know, testimony that the disciple Matthew wrote the Gospel of Matthew. And then later on, you know, over the past 200 years, people have picked apart the text and looked at it. We realize that Matthew wasn't the first Gospel of Matthew. Mark was. But what Mark wasn't even a disciple, and Matthew uses Mark, so that doesn't make sense. And then the dating and just different stuff. So now you'll have many theologians who will say, look, we kind of don't know. Some still hold on to there's these early testaments, so we hold on to that. But I think if we're, we're honest, we don't really know. And for me, I'm not saying without certainty, because I don't think anyone really knows. But I don't believe the author of this amazing gospel was the disciple Matthew. That's not saying I disregard him playing a part. I think he would have wrote down stuff. Like some of the formulated theology ideas that we get, I think someone picked that up from Matthew. I just think someone else constructed this gospel, if that makes sense. And the reason for like this new kind of approach that some people have is because of different stuff that we found out. So I want to read to you three things that they've kind of found out. I've already mentioned one, but the first is Matthew does not seem to be the earliest gospel. So that's tricky, because why does Matthew use Mark? You wouldn't think a disciple would do that. 
Secondly, it does not seem to be, have been written in Hebrew or Aramaic, which is another surprising thing if Matthew's disciple wrote, because that's the language Matthew would have been most, you know, accustomed to. So it's another kind of odd thing. And it, it does not seem to have been written by an apostle, let alone Matthew. It's one of the last things people will say. And this is a commentary, so this is anyone you can buy. Buy good commentaries on different Gospels. You'll find different opinion. There's a lot of different thought about it, but there's a reason I'm telling you this. Because I think sometimes we miss something in these Gospels. We miss something that I believe the Spirit of God wants to to reveal to us. And in this section of scripture we're looking at, it seems to be the scribe's way of showing us their process. And I think we miss that. What we read here seems to be, to me, like a little nudge of what the scribe's process was. To be a kingdom of heaven scribe. <coughs> And I think we can learn something from it if we're willing to. And we can learn something from this scribe who would have learned from Matthew. I'm sure there would have been written stuff from Matthew that he kind of jiggled up and then, you know, filtered it all together. Or it could have been a school of theologians, some or a school of scribes, some theologians think that. Who knows? Or it could have just been Matthew. So sit wherever you want, but I think we discover something in this section. We discover something that the person who wrote this gospel learned from Matthew. Something that we can use to become scribes of the kingdom of heaven. And I think we would all like that, right? To be scribes of the kingdom of heaven. Let's read this section of scripture together now. And this is what we read says, have you understood all this? They answered, yes. I just want to pause there. I kind of love, like, Jesus is like, have you understood all of this? And they're like, yes. And he's like, no, you haven't. <laughs> like, it's kind of like a parent. I feel like Jesus is just being a dad. Then, you know, you tell your kids, you understand what I'm, yes, I get it. Okay, let me, let me walk you through it. I feel like it's one of, but here we go. He goes on, he goes, and he said to them, Therefore, every scribe who has become a disciple in the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a household who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. When Jesus had finished these parables, he left that place. So I love how Jesus ends here. It's kind of like a mic drop. Boom. Here you go. You said you understood. I don't know if you really do. Here's one more story. I'm out. Like, if Jesus would have been around in nowadays, I feel like he would have broke a lot of mics because I think he just would have, or maybe he would have, like, can you heal a microphone? <laughs> maybe he could. Maybe he dropped it. Maybe part of his trick, like, it shatters and he picks it back up. Like, I don't know. Sorry. My mind's going to different places. But I love how this section of teaching ends. And I think if we're willing to sit with this idea of old and new treasures, we discover something amazing. Something that can help us in our progressive versus conservative Christianity battle. Because it seems like a lot of time these sides are at conflict with one another. And it seems like as we dive deeper into Jesus' teaching, as we discover more things theologically, it seems like there's more and more conflict within Christianity. And I don't believe that's a good thing. I believe you can already see evidence to that. I mean, what, we got some old, older, wiser people in the room? Ha has anyone ever been through a church split? Oh, yes. Yeah, how horrible. It's never a good thing, right? So what do we do? What do we need to do with this battle where it seems like there's no victors? I mean, you ever watch the, the, you know, them debate on issues? The one subject I got the best grade on in uni was apologetics. I hate apologetics, so it's just people <laughs> arguing. Or maybe it's because I could be a good lawyer, because I know how to argue. But it just gets so frustrating because no one wins. They just go back and forth at each other, and you're, you're, you've gone nowhere. 
and it creates more division. And if you read comments on YouTube, especially if you catch it, oh my goodness, people start going at each other. Where's Jesus' love in all of this? And I believe in this passage, we discover something that whoever wrote the Gospel of Matthew discovered from Jesus. I think it's something that can transform the way we handle this issue. And in this passage, Jesus is showing us we need both sides. And we kind of see this again and again in Jesus' ministry. He seems to push at religious authority, but like he still seems to hold on to it, right? There's this delicate play Jesus almost does, where he like tiptoes over there and you're like, wow, look at him. Jesus is a bit legalistic, and then he tiptoes back and you're like, oh, no, look, he's not. Look how inclusive he is. But then he tiptoes back in the middle and then you're like, what are you doing, Jesus? I think it's part of the reason he was kind of nailed to a cross. On top of being God's plan, I think people were frustrated because you couldn't fit him in a box. Because Jesus showed again and again we needed both sides. And I love, as Richard Rohr uh, writes in his book, Jesus' uh, Alternative Plan, uh, I didn't put the little subheading, The Sermon on the Mount. Uh, he says this, Jesus holds on to the foundation and center of all, while moving the boundaries out much further than almost anyone expected. Now to me, that's an amazing sentence. I think it's evidence throughout Jesus' ministry, throughout the gospel. I think it's something that kind of punches us in the face in this section of teaching about old and new treasures. About how the scribe of the kingdom of heaven is going to bring out old and new treasures. So I want to make something a bit clear of what I think and what I think this, this teaching kind of shows me. I believe the extreme end of conservative and progressive Christianity are both toxic. So you got to make everyone mad and anyone who watches this online, they can all say bad stuff because I think they're both toxic at their extreme end. Neither one are healthy. And it seems like we keep going to that extreme end. There never seems to be a middle ground, right? We always seem to be planting our flags on the far end. And I think there's toxicity in both. For me, an extreme conservative Christianity, it leads to an isolated and irrelevant community. Because they're too focused on holding on to central truths of old with a world that is changing, a world that is different than 2,000 years ago. Yes, we need to hold on to some things, but the extreme end of that excludes people. It isolates us. I mean, a perfect example of this is, uh, you guys might know of this, I won't, won't say the church's name, but there is a church in the States that's got a bit of a reputation. They're a small church, very legalistic, are very isolated. Uh, no one probably cares too much for what they have to say. Uh, and they do some horrible stuff. They go to people who might be getting funerals. You know, if they were in the army or in the military, they'll show up at funerals all the time with signs saying that the person died is in hell. That's, that extreme end is toxic. It isolates. It makes us irrelevant and we don't want that. <clears throat> So you might think, oh, well, then we'll just go to the extreme end of progressive Christianity. Let's go there. No, I think extreme progressive Christianity leads to standing for nothing in a betrayal of essential truth. If we let everything go, then we're betraying essential truths. Now, for me, uh, this comes where I, if you haven't picked up, I read everything. So you probably can't put me in a box. Uh, but... There's some stuff that I do struggle to read. And that's whenever I read a theologian or a scholar who studied, and they seem to be so far on the extreme, you know, including stuff on the progressive end, 
that they start not even admitting to what Jesus did. Not even holding on to the significance of the incarnation of God coming in flesh. And I think for me, like that's the extreme end, right? And then we don't stand for anything. If we let anything go, we can't build a community. Every community, right or wrong, has stuff that it stands for. And if we go to the extreme end of progressive Christianity, we're going to stand for nothing. And I think we learn something in this debate. And for me, uh, when it comes to us in this debate about conservative and progressive Christianity, we need to realize that both are needed, and we are called to hold the tension so we discover the truth in the middle. Sorry, I forgot to put that on. I'll just double check YouTube. But I think that's what we see Jesus do. Again and again and again throughout the Gospels. You read the epistles. You see the followers trying to do that. They're trying to hold this tension. And I think that's what we're called to do if we want to be scribes of the kingdom of heaven. We must be willing to wrestle with this tension as Jesus does. We must be willing to accept that this might not be popular all the time. Because it might frustrate people, right? I can't put you in a box then. Oh, you're just a conservative Christian or a fundamentalist. Oh, no, actually, I think, you know, what, you think that? Oh, you're just progressive. No, actually, then you don't fit in a box and it makes people mad. But I think that's where we're called to be. We're called to not be in either of these camps too far. We're called to hold the tension. Because either alternative, if you go too far one way or too far the other way, leads to something destructive. It leads us away from the kingdom of heaven, in my opinion. And I think scribes of the kingdom of heaven know that repression or exclusivity is a means of control. So we go to the extreme end of a conservative Christianity, we're wanting to control things. We're wanting to hold so tightly because the world's spinning so fast. Everything's changing so fast. Well, the expression or inclusivity is a means of avoiding control. If we go too far the other way, we're just not holding control. We're just putting our hands up and saying, ah, too complicated. Just going to stand back here, you know, do what you want. Whatever rules are, yeah, that's all right. You come in. No, we got to find the truth lies somewhere in between. To me, uh, a good example of this makes me think of two kids fighting. Have you ever had two kids fighting when they're both right? Have you ever seen that? Right? All the time, right? Well, all the time, right? That's what I see. I see like there's, there's two different sides. Sometimes you get a fight and both have some elements of truth in it. You know, for my kids, you know what? You might have Esther gets frustrated with Gideon, so she screams at Gideon, tries to hit Gideon, because Gideon took her toy, which wasn't right, but then Gideon gets mad, and Gideon pushes Esther, which wasn't right. But they're all fighting for their justice. There's both elements of truth in it. And when they come to tell you the story, you never get the whole story, right? You get bits, you get one end, and he goes off to Gideon, how could you? I can't believe you. I didn't do that. You hear more of the story, you and then usually I have to go find Caleb, and hopefully if he's a teenager and he had his door open, he can tell me what happened. Like, Caleb, what really happened? <laughs> and then that's not even the whole truth. Like, all three of those stories, and the truth somewhere there in the middle. And I feel like that's what we need to do if we want to be scribes of the kingdom of heaven. Because there is massive damage happening to many church communities, which is leading to fractured communities. And sometimes it's over the silliest thing. You know, my parents, when they did went to church, and uh, before they had their reasons and stuff, there was a church split over, there's a, a passage in scripture where it talks about being an elder and you need to have children. 
So you have, have to try to say, all right, that means plural. You gotta have more than one kid. So if you wanna be an elder and you got one kid, you're out. You know, it doesn't work. Other half said, nah, we don't think that. We want this individual to be an elder. And the church split over that. And I just laugh. Like, seriously. But if you look at some of the stuff church splits over, like, it can seem so funny at times. And there's so much fracturing happening within the Christian community. You have both these movements with brilliant theologians at both ends, and they don't all do it, but you got a great growing number of more and more that attack one another. More and more that aren't willing to see if there's a middle ground. And I think if we are not careful in the battle between progressive and conservative Christianity continue. We'll be leaving the church in shambles for the next generation. And what I mean by that is I think if we go too far down one end, we're going to push people away from the gospel of Jesus. We're going to push people out of the church. And if we don't watch this battle, you're going to have churches that are one or two ways. You're going to have churches that are very isolated, very exclusive, very irrelevant. And then on the other end, you're going to have churches that won't be able to stand for anything, leading to communities never really growing. And I don't want to see that. I want to see more scribes of the kingdom of heaven. Willing to do the uncomfortable stuff Jesus does again and again and hold the tension and work with it. And he tiptoe to one side for one thing and then tiptoe back and you do a split sometimes and somersaults, but you find the truth in the middle. You hold the tension like Jesus does. So are we willing to end this battle here at Highfields Church of Christ? Because I think that's something we have to think about. We have a beautiful church community that is growing. And I think that's all because of God. And we can't control what the world does, but we can control what happens here. So are we willing to kind of end that battle here and hold the tension like Jesus did so we discover truth? If we do that, I believe we'll be being scribes of the kingdom of heaven. We'll have more evidence of the kingdom of heaven here all around us. I believe this would lead to a community full of love, grace, and mercy, and diversity. And I hope we're willing to go on that journey. I hope we're willing to take this way that Jesus ends this teaching about the kingdom of heaven, pointing out that if we're really scribes, we're going to bring out old and new treasures. We're going to be willing to hold the tension. We're going to be willing not to plant our flags. Do you know how scary it is not to plant your flags in one hand? I mean, I can tell you, because I've had people say, oh, you're progressive, and then they talk to me, oh, you're conservative now, and then I'm everywhere. But we're not meant to plant flags. We're meant to bring out the old and new treasures. We're meant to hold the tension and discover the truth that the Holy Spirit wants us to discover. Because there's new truths waiting to be discovered. Even now, when we break down Scripture and Bible verses, there's new things to discover there's new things the Holy Spirit wants to share. It doesn't mean you throw out everything old. No, we bring out old and new treasures. We hold that tension. And I really hope we can do that here at Highfield Church of Christ. I really hope we can build a community here that's doing it. And I hope you'll go on that journey with me. And I hope that you'll start discovering some of the truth as you get better at holding the tension. Because it's a beautiful thing. And you discover some amazing stuff when you broaden 
what you're reading and what you're studying and you really dive in and discover some amazing stuff that there. And I want to encourage you to go on that journey. I'm just going to close in prayer and then the worship team is uh, going to come up and lead us in a song or two. Okay, song or two. Let's see what happens. <laughs> just patience waiting. I don't know if it's going to be two or one. Or... So yeah, I'll just pray. God, I thank you for who you are. I thank you for your love and for your grace and for your mercy. I thank you that you call us to be scribes of the kingdom of heaven. You don't want us going to the extreme of any end with progressive or conservative Christianity. You want us to hold the tension. You're calling us to hold the tension and discover the truth in the middle. And I pray that you'll help us do that. I pray that we'll be a church that's different. A church that's full of scribes for your kingdom. A church that's cultivating the kingdom of heaven here and now in our communities. I pray that you show us how to do that. I pray that we lean into it. And I pray no matter where we're at with our journey with you, that you just let us know how much you love us. Just as we are. <laughs> And from that center, that's where everything starts. And I pray you help us sit there. In your amazing name, amen.